Welcome to C3 In This Together, 30 Minutes in Our Own Voice, a mental health awareness series. Today's topic is mental health and chronic health conditions. We will hear from someone who's helping others cope, manage, and navigate chronic health conditions. My hope throughout this series, of course, is that together we will be the generation that ends the silence, the shame, and the stigma of health conditions. Today, our guest is Dr. Shernet Matthews. Dr. Matthews is a chief or is the chief of radiation oncology at Prisma Health in Greenville, South Carolina, where of course she specializes in women's health and daily she sees breast, gynecology and lung cancers. Uh, she's an expert in her field and we are so glad to have her with us today. She also serves as the South Carolina Women's Ministry Director for her organization, where she integrates medical knowledge and spiritual knowledge to empower women to be the best that they can to be both physically and spiritually. And I like that, so I'll say it again. So her work entails that she integrates both her medical knowledge and her spiritual knowledge to empower women to be the best that they can be both physically and spiritually. Dr. Matthews, it's such an honor to have you today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, Dr. Cassell. Thank you for inviting me. Good, good. And of course, on a personal note, Dr. Matthews, Dr. Shernet uh, is a dear and treasured friend of our family. So I'm just so honored to have, of course, an expert in the field. She is in demand. Uh, she's quite busy. But of course, uh, being a friend of the family, I was able to pull some strings, beg her to be with us. So Dr. Shernet, thank you, my friend, for being with us today. Well, before we jump into our time together, allow me to share some statistics surrounding chronic health conditions. So of course, we're gonna dive into that topic today, but just wanted to make sure we give you some statistics, uh, some things to be uh, aware of as it relates to chronic uh, health conditions. So. The first one is this, that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, they define chronic diseases as conditions that last one year or more and require ongoing medical attention or limits activities in terms of daily living. So again, when we talk about chronic uh, diseases, chronic health conditions, uh, by definition, we're talking about those conditions that last for a year or more and they impact daily living. Uh, these common uh, chronic uh, diseases include heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, obesity, oral diseases. Those and, and so many more are considered chronic health conditions. We do know by way of statistics, and of course, uh, Dr. Matthews will speak to this a little bit more. We do know that uh, chronic health conditions can lead to being hospitalized, long-term disability, reduce uh, someone's quality of life, and in cases, uh, many cases, death. Uh, by way of statistics, just some more statistics, nearly half, approximately 45%, or 133 Americans, uh, is listed as being suffering from or suffer from at least one chronic disease. According to the CDC, in the U.S. alone, chronic diseases account for nearly 75% of healthcare spending. Wow, wow, wow. We do know that, just a few more, that more than two thirds of all deaths are caused by one or more chronic diseases, such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic uh, pulmonary disease, and diabetes. Uh, research also shows that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has increased the prevalence of uh, chronic health conditions. And just a couple more, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, chronic illnesses such as cancer, heart disease, diabetes may make you more likely or put you at risk to having a mental health condition. And as it relates to children and adolescents, we do know that chronic illnesses puts them at a higher risk than their healthy pairs of developing a mental illness. Wow, staggering and sobering statistic. So Dr. Shernet, would you uh, go ahead and just tell us, uh, as we begin our first question, tell us about your work and what are some of the myths 
uh, and the truth surrounding your work. Tell us what you do. Okay. I am a radiation oncologist. And a lot of people go, what is that? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> a radiation oncologist is an oncologist, a cancer that treats, um, sorry, a doctor that treats cancer, but I use radiation to treat cancer. Um, most people are familiar with medical oncologists. They use chemotherapy to treat mm -hmm. cancer. We tend to say that radiation oncology is a well-kept secret. Um, so basically, I have what I describe as big toys. I have what looks like an x-ray machine, and the patients lay on a table, and that table turns around, and the machine that delivers the radiation turns around, and we have to do a planning session for every cancer that we treat, and we outline the area that we're going to deliver the radiation to, and that becomes the radiation field. So for instance, the simple thing to explain is breast. So if I'm treating the right breast, then I will do a scan on my patient, a CAT scan. I will be able to outline the right breast and the area where the cancer was removed from. And the machine is able through technology, because everything is technology today, um, to take that plan that I have done specific to the right breast and deliver radiation and not deliver radiation all over the body. And so the radiation causes damage um, to the DNA of the cell. And because cancer can be viewed as a parasite, right? And um, it hijacks your normal cells and um, takes over that machinery to replicate themselves and therefore continue to live on. So if I damage that DNA, then that cancer cell can't continue to replicate itself. And so it dies off, but the normal cell has the ability to grow back. So that's why that damage is repaired. And so that's what I do to treat cancer. And the interesting thing about what I do, unlike other cancer doctors who need to know the exact type of cancer, because chemotherapy, you have to use the right drug against a cancer so you can kill it. Radiation, for all intensive purposes, probably there's about a few percentage of cancer that we need to know what type it really is because the amount of radiation matters, of course, but it doesn't matter to us. We just need to know we have cancer and we just damage the DNA and we kill cancer. And that's how the radiation works. So that's what I do for a living. I see patients, I prescribe radiation and we kill cancer. Wow. Good. Wow. That's great insight. Uh, you know, so many of us, of course, who are not in the field, the, the average man would not know that. So we're so grateful that you've given yeah. us insights to that. Now, the other piece of uh, that question, the second part of that question is what are some of the myths? Of course, the moment that we hear the word cancer, we often think of a death sentence. Right. So that, of course, is one of the greatest myths. Can you speak to some of those myths or untruths surrounding cancer and the work that you do? And let me also back up if you don't mind. I listed a lot of statistics. We're going to put that on the screen uh, when this airs. But can you speak to that as well? Uh, maybe not in depth to all of the statistics, but what are your thoughts surrounding that? Because they were sobering. There were a lot of statistics. Would you say that that's true? And then again, go into what are some of the myths uh, surrounding the work that you do? Statistics are true. Unfortunately, we are seeing more and more chronic illnesses being diagnosed in the form of high blood pressure diabetes, stroke. And a lot of it has to do, unfortunately, with our life choices. Um, people are, um, it's unbelievable to people to realize that, um, that we have the ability to modify our risk factors. And risk factors are things that increases the likelihood of you developing a chronic illness. And for heart disease, which we all know is the number one killer among men and women, and that's worldwide, um, their modifiable risk factors has to do with tobacco use. It has to do with high blood pressure. It has to do with high blood cholesterol, and it has to do with type two diabetes. And all of those things that are listed are things that we have under our control by the diet that we choose, um, by the behaviors that we choose. And the similar things exist for cancer. Tobacco use, we know is one of the number one causes for um, uh lung cancer and poor diet, being overweight, lack of exercise, those are the things that increases the risk of these chronic illnesses. 
So unfortunately, we are a sedentary nation. And because we're not moving, and we are unfortunately, the obesity rate is increasing, it's now about 66%. Um, so unfortunately, we're seeing these chronic illnesses go up because our lifestyle um, needs to be adjusted um, with our diet, with being overweight and lack of exercise. And those three things we feel are um, increasing these chronic illnesses. And the CDC says that if we can incorporate these things in our, in our lifestyle, that we have the ability, if we can reduce these three risk factors, and I'll name them again, poor diet, inactivity, and smoking, we could prevent, get this, 80% of heart disease, 80% of type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancers. Wow. So that's kind of sobering. Yes, it is. Wow. Yes, Thank you for speaking sobering. to that. And, um, you know, I often say, you know, in the work that I do, uh, mental health, that statistics uh, are what they are. They represent people and they represent real life situations, right? Statistics are not meant to be political. They're not meant to be anything else outside of, they really represent what's happening uh, with us. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Give us maybe two or three myths surrounding your work. All right, so from a cancer standpoint, I think one of the biggest things that we face is kind of what you alluded to in a way, um, people come in and they think that they did something wrong to get cancer. You know, smoking and all that kind of has a little taboo with it. Of course, that's a possibility. But for the most part, um, you can't get cancer um, if no if if other people in the family they feel they can't get cancer if other people in the family don't have cancer, and that's not necessarily true. Um, only five to ten percent of cancers are passed down from parents to children. So most cancers are sporadic. Um, just being alive, uh, going through life, and making the choices that we have can influence what happens to us. And unfortunately, cancer can develop. Um, another myth that people have that I also like to kind of debunk a little bit is that if I get a biopsy or I remove the cancer, it's going to make the cancer grow. And that's existed from I don't know how long. I heard that in medical school. It's a myth that goes on. And you hear families say, well, they, they cut her open and the cancer just spread everywhere. And that is not true. We need to do a biopsy so that we can diagnose the cancer so we can deliver treatment. And a lot of times for most of the cancers that we um, treat, um, surgery is the best treatment choice. Remove the bulk of the cancer or all of the cancer and then follow that with radiation and or chemotherapy or both. Um, but unfortunately, some patients are diagnosed really late. And when you go ahead and remove the cancer, the cancer is already spread. And so they may not be able to remove it. So they have to close the patient back up. And then therefore, people get that stigma that think, oh, it's because they open the patient that that's why the cancer spread. So those are some stigmas that exist and some myths that exist when it comes to cancer. Wow. Thank you for debunking those myths. Um, and I know even as this will go to airing uh, in a few days, that there are many of us uh, who we have loved ones, we know someone that is coping, managing uh, cancer and other chronic me uh, medical conditions. So uh, this is giving hope, this is giving meaning, and this is giving insight uh, to that journey. So thank you so much for destigmatizing uh, you know, those untruths <laughs> surrounding, yeah. uh, you know, cancer and, and chronic uh, conditions, but more specifically cancer. What would you say to someone or someone who has a loved one who has a diagnosis of chronic, of a chronic health condition? Of course, you'll speak specifically to cancer, but, uh, you know, what would you say to someone who will be watching this, who'll be listening uh, they themselves, or perhaps they have a loved one, what are some of the things you would say to them? Well, I think the first thing I say, even for cancer or any other um, chronic illness diagnosis is don't panic. Um, most patients begin to panic. They um, go to Dr. Google and they read things or they blog and they read things and all of a sudden they take the worst and they apply it to themselves. And I think you just don't panic. Take a deep breath and recognize that most chronic illness are treatable, right? Are treatable. And even cancer today is being viewed as a chronic illness. Most stage one and stage two cancers are curable. Um, if we have diagnoses that are more locally advanced, 
that is more, I say today, you look at that more like a chronic illness, like high blood pressure or diabetes, that we have treatment options and we can continue to treat patients for a long time. And then you have to be empowered to recognize that you have the ability to take care of your illness. A lot of that is in your court. I try to remind my patients that they're the center of what we do. We revolve around them in healthcare. And we are here to provide the information, but if they don't do what we tell them to do, really you're not gonna have a good outcome. So you have to be empowered to know about your disease and you have to follow the instructions that you're given to help your disease. And I think that's an important part that most patients don't realize is that they have a part, a bigger part to pay, play in their care. I can tell you all that you need to know to do, but if you don't actually apply it, then it's not going to bring about necessary um, outcome that we want to see. Wow, thank you for that. And I love what you said that uh, the work that you do uh, surrounds the patient, right? One of the ways that I say it, again, from my feel in terms of uh, uh, mental health and therapy is, you know, I say to patients, I say to clients, you're the expert in your story, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, Dr. Charnette Matthews, you are the expert uh, in, in oncology, right? I'm the expert in mental health, and we know that. But really, those that we serve, they are the experts in their stories, right? Because they know their symptoms, they know what they're seeing, they know what they're feeling. And I like what you said, that we have and they have the control uh, to uh, uh, to decide the outcomes that they would like to see. So we do want right. to let people know that, that yes, you go in, you see an expert in the field, but you really are that expert uh, right. in your story, uh, in your body, in the symptoms. Um, I say also to loved ones that we rely on you to be the expert for your family members to also help come alongside them in their journey uh, of walking through whatever they're facing. Uh, let's go to the next uh, question. Uh, what do you want people to know about access to care and available resources? Uh, so many people, again, when they get a diagnosis of, of a chronic uh, health condition or cancer, uh, they don't know where to go. Where do I start? Uh, you know, we're panicking, we're overwhelmed. Where do we go? Who do we see? What are available resources? What if I don't have a lot of money? What if I don't have insurance? What if I live uh, in the suburbs? And the list goes on and on. What if I'm from the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and you know there's uh, health disparities? What do I do? Right. Well, just to speak just briefly on health disparity, I mean, that's a big thing. And we heard a lot about that when COVID came around. But I want to say this, um, access to health care, especially in the African-American community and the minority community, has improved over the last few decades. And uh, one of the issues that we had with access or lack of access to health care was delayed diagnosis. So patients were being diagnosed at later stages, and I can speak specifically for cancer, were being diagnosed at later stages. So we know the later you are diagnosed, the worse the outcome. And so we saw a lot of information that said, oh, you know, African-Americans do worse in this cancer versus that cancer or that disease versus this disease. But the earlier you're diagnosed, um, whether you're Caucasian or whether you're African-American or any other ethnic group, if you're diagnosed early with your disease, you're going to have the same outcome as the next um, population of people. So access to health care is very important. I think that is becoming uh, improved over time. We're seeing mortality rate um, decrease in, or say, improve in um, African-American communities. And we're seeing things get better over the last couple of decades. So definitely that has improved. Of course, we have a long way to go. So what I say to patients is, information is there and your primary care physician or your family physician is your primary access. They know how to navigate the system for you. They are really the central person because I'm an expert in my field. So you're not going to come directly to me. You're going to be referred to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same with any other oncologist. We're at the I would always say the end of the food chain, so to speak, mm -hmm. because the primary care physician is the first person to make that diagnosis or at least refer that person to the specialist who can make that diagnosis. And then once you, they reach into the specialist's hands, then everything is navigated that way. But we send all of our notes. We do our communications to the primary care physician and to the family physicians. 
The healthcare departments within your community is also a good place to get information and resources and to, to be able to navigate the system as well. And what a lot of people don't know, hospitals or community centers also have access to the things that you need, like screening tools. Uh, there's Best Chance Network um, is something that's across states and um, maybe across the nation itself, where you can have free mammograms, you can have free colonoscopies. And so there's really no excuse um, when these things are available, but we have to empower people to know these things. And so the best way is through the health department and through your primary care physician to kind of get the resources that you need um, to get the help that you need. Wow, great, great. Uh, I'd like to circle back. This was uh, not a question that we had talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. but we're both embedded uh, in the faith community. We know that it's our world. We are Christians. Um, you know, we serve churches. We we are ministers in our churches. Uh, so I know we're going to be speaking to that population as well. Mm -hmm. uh, while this is not primarily a um, a faith based uh, session, but you know, we're clear in who we are. Uh, but there are those in the faith based community, whether it's Christian, whether it's Muslim. Uh, whether it's Judaism, and the list goes on and on. There are a lot of myths surrounding um, uh, chronic health conditions, uh, cancer. Can you just maybe speak to that really briefly? For example, uh, in the faith-based community, someone will say, well, I don't need to go see the doctor because if I pray, then I will be healed. We know that that's true. Or, you know, I don't go and take uh, physicals or as a male, I don't go, and the list goes on. And can you just speak to that briefly? Because we will be speaking to that demographic uh, just by way of our connection and just by way of who we are. Right. I think the best thing to say is I am a born again Christian and I believe in the Lord, but I believe the Lord has given me this gift to help others. And so I still believe that there's divine healing, but I believe healing can also come through what I do. Um, so getting, getting, going to get your um, health taken care of, getting your diagnosis, getting your screening, um, whether that be your mammograms or your PSAs or your colonoscopies is what you should do. And then you know what to pray about and continue to do what you're supposed to do until if God's going to use the medicine to heal you, he will do that. If God is going to divinely intervene, he will do that. God is going to take care of you while you go through your journey. But you have to have faith and believe. Believe in God that he will use what he has empowered us to do. I look at myself as being one of God's angels on earth, doing his work here on earth. And I feel like he has empowered me with this knowledge to help other people. So I do, I do believe in divine healing. I do believe that God can do all things, but I do also believe that he has given man the knowledge. He has given man the ability. And therefore that is something that will bring forth healing as well. If we could continue to believe and do what he's supposed, we're supposed to do. Wow. Thank you for that, Dr. Uh, Matthews. That's so important because again, we speak to the faith-based community. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, we are born again believers. We're Christians. And we often hear that, right, that we don't do medicine, psychology, we don't believe in, you know, science, uh, you know, we just believe in the Bible, which is, that's our rule, our government, that's what gives us hope, we know that. But again, those who are watching, we want you to hear that, that God has given us creative ways to be mm -hmm. healed, number one, right, through our natural body, right, our bodies can heal ourselves, or yes. creative ways through medicine, which is what Dr. Matthews uh, does, right? And then, of course, there's divine healing. So we want to expose that to you, that there are all avenues for healing, right? We are a tripartite being, body, soul, and spirit, and we can be healed in all aspects. As we begin to uh, bring this to a close, uh, could you uh, speak to uh, this question? What do you want people to know about managing our mental health? Uh, you know, the work that I do, you know, I believe in um, mental health parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y, which is the same priority that's given to uh, medicine or, or medical health. We believe the same priority should be given to mental health, right? And of course, you know, you can speak to this as well. 
that when someone is diagnosed with a chronic health condition, uh, their mental health implications. Uh, what would you say to someone um, concerning managing our mental health, taking care of that aspect of who we are? I think it is of utmost importance. I think it's something that we really, really have to do. And even in the oncology world, that's become a very big focus. It used to be when I first started in oncology a decade or a half ago, we did not have a place for the patients to go. Um, they're embarking on this journey that is life changing and it's mm -hmm. devastating to hear the diagnosis of cancer. And we did not have a way to deal with them. And so it was mandated that we had to develop some sort of integrative oncology to deal with the whole person. And that became very important because um, before that uh, got placed into um, a part of our, our um, focus on the patient, we, the physician, had to be the one to do it. So sometimes you walk into a room and a patient is depressed, they're crying, they're overwhelmed, they don't have transportation, they don't have, you know, finances. And we had to stay in that room and deal with it. And then you have your patients, you know, out there waiting to see you, but you have to deal with this one patient. So it is very, very important that we recognize that our mind and our physical body are one. One cannot exist without the other. Mental health, or was as I say, psychological well-being is very, very important. It affects how we feel. It affects how we think. It affects how we behave. And you can't have one without the other. I say, I'll tell my patients, your mind is a powerful place. And how you think is how you're going to react. And that is so important to recognize that your mind is so powerful that it can control how your disease behaves. Sure. Right. Because if you've given up, if you've given in, then that's what's going to happen with your body. But if you have a positive outlook and I'm not saying a positive outlook cures your cancer, no, but I'm saying it. having a positive outlook about your treatment, about what you're doing, about how you're reacting, your body somehow follows that and everything just kind of works together. So I think it's very uh, um, important to recognize that we're intertwined and you can't do one without the other. It used to be that we thought we could. Nobody paid attention to your mental um, health uh, well-being. We just focus on the body, focus on the body. But if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if, if you're in fear, you, you just stop. You don't do anything. And that's not going to take care of what's happening in your body. So it's very important for us to pay attention to our psychological well-being. Well, thank you for speaking to that, Dr. Matthews. And I just want to highlight that. I can't echo that enough. Uh, the research is clear uh, that your psychological well-being, your mental health well-being, it does impact your medical well-being, right? Uh, one of the things I love to say is what's good for your brain is good for your body. What's uh -huh. good for your body is good for your brain, right? Uh -huh. So we want to really encourage people to please uh, be taking care of your mental health uh, if you're not mentally well, then you won't be physically well and you won't be spiritually well. And Dr. Matthews uh, said that uh, so well that uh, we are intertwined, right? And we all deal with mental health, right? Uh, from the uh, top of our heads down to the soles of our feet, right? Uh, so we want people to be taking care of your mental health. Uh, Dr. Matthews, I want to say this to you. Thank you for being an amazing inspiration. Uh, uh, as you were speaking, what came to my mind is that so often in the work that I do, one of the reasons why, particularly in the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and of course, you know, we speak to all demographics, but one of the things that I often hear is we don't see uh, clinicians or people in the medical field that look like us, mm -hmm. right? or who mm -hmm. practice uh, cultural competency. So thank you for not only being competent in your field, but for being culturally competent. And of course, when we speak of culture and diversity, we're not just talking about black or white or gender or faith or race, or the list goes on and on, or preference. We're talking about diversity of thought. So thank you for being that person. Uh, there are young people who are gonna be watching this and you're gonna give such hope to them. And not only thank you for being competent and culturally competent, but uh, we can sense this. Of course, I know you personally, but thank you for practicing cultural humility, 
And that mm-hmm. simply means that you uh, allow people to share their story, share their history, and share who they are. So to thank you so much for being an inspiration um, uh, you know, in your field and to so many who will be watching. Well, my friends, as we begin to wrap up our time together, this has been a wealth of information, a wealth of resources, and we're so grateful that uh, we've had uh, an expert in the field. I believe in collaborative care, uh, working with those um, in, in both medical and mental health. So I'm just grateful for Dr. Matthews. Dr. Matthews, how can people reach out to you? Of course, we know that uh, you practice uh, in, you know, in, in your field, but also we know that you're available to uh, do seminars, you're available to do workshops, you're willing to um, go and make sure people are empowered and equipped and made aware. So how can people reach out to you if they're saying, uh, I need some help uh, in my organization, at my school, uh, in my women's ministry, at my church, at my faith-based organization? How can we reach out to you? Well, from a professional standpoint, um, Prisma Health, P-R-I-S-M-A Health.org is where you'll find most of um, the staff that's working for them. So if you go to radiation oncology under uh, Prisma Health, you will find me there. For our church, I have an organization um, called Sisters United, and we have a website that's South Carolina abbreviated SC, sistersunited.org, and you can contact me through that. And we also have our state website for our church. Um, We are part of the Church of God of Prophecy, and so it's easy to find me there in the South Carolina Church of God of Prophecy. So those are the probably the easiest ways to contact me. Probably the Prisma Health will be the shortest route to radiation oncology, and you can find me there. Great, great. So we're going to be putting that on the screen. Uh, My friends, I trust that you've been inspired today. Uh, that you've received a, uh, just a wealth of resources I mentioned. We do want to remind you that if you or your loved one is in crisis, please contact 988. That's the 24-hour, seven-day National Crisis and Suicide Lifeline. Of course, we are highlighting chronic health conditions, uh, but this series surrounds mental health. We also want to invite you for more resources about mental health, Uh, Visit the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which is NAMI.org. All of these are going to come up on the screen. And then, as always, I want to invite you personally to visit our website at c3inthistogether.com. If you are impacted by this video, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, share this video, comment, and let us know how you've been impacted so together we can bring hope. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Matthews, for all that you do and for being with us. We certainly appreciate you so much. We speak uh, well wishes. We speak blessings uh, to you and your family and the work that you do. Uh, Thank you for bringing hope uh, to so many uh, during uh, such a difficult time that they face. And my friends, we look forward to seeing you next time in our series, uh, 30 Minutes in Our Own Voice. Thank you again, Dr. Matthews. See you soon. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me.